Hey there, pre-med. In this video, we're gonna go through all of the essential basics of atoms. So this is a very foundational concept in general chemistry. It's maybe something you haven't seen since high school um, or even earlier. And it's something that even though it's foundational, it's something that I see pre-med students neglect as they're preparing for the MCAT in favor of doing more complex, high-level organic and biochemistry. This stuff that I'm going to be talking about is directly tested on the MCAT, and so we want to just make sure we have these definitions and they are clear and they're fresh and not rusty on testing. So let's dive in. We'll start, of course, with the atom. The atom is our building block of all of our structures, all of our proteins, molecules, everything around us is atomic in nature. The atom is not a new scientific concept. Thousands of years ago in Greek, Greek philosophers talked about this idea of an uncuttable, indivisible part, the smallest part of all of nature, all of our visible world, and they called that atomos, which means indivisible or uncuttable, and it's where we get the word atom today. And it wasn't until the early 1900s that there started to be some really cool research. It was really a fascinating, passionate time in general chemistry where they were realizing actually there are subparticles to the atom as well. So much of our current knowledge of atomic structure did happen relatively recently in the early 1900s through the 1950s and 60s with the nuclear fission projects. Starting off, the atom has three major subparticles. We have neutrons, protons, and electrons. Protons and neutrons make up the nucleus, and we realized that there were protons because we were able to observe positive charges in individual atoms and components. So our protons have the positive charge component. But scientists also found that in their research, the proton size didn't make up the actual size of the nucleus that they were observing. So they realized that there were these neutrons, these neutral particles that contributed to the atomic mass. So our mass number of a given atom is the combination of protons and neutrons in that atom. Surrounding our nucleus of a given atom are electrons, which are our negatively charged particles that orbit around our nucleus, our protons and neutrons, in specific energy shells. And as we know from electrostatics, positive charges and negative charges attract, opposite charges attract. And that positive charge attracting the negatively charged electrons is known as our effective nuclear charge. So we can actually measure that interaction through our effective nuclear charge, which is denoted as capital Z. So we have our electrons and they're in these different energy shells. The further out from the nucleus, the higher energy the shell is. So we kind of have these discrete areas where electrons orbit the nucleus. Now in a neutral element, the number of protons, neutrons, and electrons all equal each other. So for example, in oxygen, we have eight neutrons, eight electrons, and eight protons, and that's in a purely neutral element. However, we've noticed in real life that those numbers don't always add up, and the mass number of neutrons plus protons in a given element doesn't always seem to line up with what we would think if there were equal numbers of protons and neutrons. So this is called isotopes. Isotopes are where we have an element that has the same elemental structure but a different number of neutrons in the element. So for example, we have oxygen 16, which is eight neutrons plus eight protons. So we add those together, we get oxygen 16. That's our normal neutral element. But we can also have oxygen 17, where we have eight protons and nine neutrons, and even oxygen 18, where we have eight protons and 10 neutrons. So we can actually see that there's different isotopes, different mass numbers of a given element depending on the number of neutrons present. We'll still have the same number of electrons and protons. So what we'll do is if we have a naturally occurring element like oxygen or hydrogen or carbon in our environment, what we do as scientists is we take the weighted average of all of the isotopes, because of course they're gonna have different mass numbers. So what we'll do is we'll say, okay, if most of the oxygen in our atmosphere is oxygen 16, that's gonna get a bigger percentage of the average than our lower quantity isotopes, but we will add them all together, we'll average them all together, and that's going to give us our atomic mass number. So our mass number that we see on our periodic table is the average 
the weighted average of all the isotopes naturally occurring for that element. So far, so good. We've got our structure of our atom and different isotopes, which are different numbers of neutrons. We can also exchange the numbers of electrons we have. Right? And our electrons have a charge, a negative charge, so if we gain or lose electrons, we're also going to be gaining or losing charge on our given atom. So if we lose electrons, we're losing negative charge and we'll become positively charged. So an ionic element is one that has either gained or lost electrons and now has a charge. So anything that loses electrons is going to end up being positively charged or cation. Anything that gains electrons is going to gain a negative charge and become an anion. We can actually describe the type of element based on whether it's likely to lose or gain electrons. So if an element is likely to lose electrons and become a cation, we call that a metal. If an element is likely to gain an electron and become negatively charged, we call that a nonmetal. So that's actually how we define metals and nonmetals on the periodic table, is how likely they are to gain or lose electrons. Now, if an element doesn't really want to gain or lose electrons, it wants to stay as, as it is, we call that a noble gas. Now, how do we know if it's going to be a noble gas? It's going to have what we call a full octet. A full octet is where we look at our last shell, our outermost shell of our electron cloud. And our outermost shell usually wants to have eight electrons. That's where it's happy, that's where it's balanced. And so our noble gases will have a full octet, will have eight electrons in its outer valence shell. We'll find them on the far right of the periodic table. Anything other than the noble gases is still trying to get to a full octet. They're trying to get as balanced as possible, either half filling or all the way filling our outer valence shell. So we'll see that our atoms on the leftmost side of our periodic table, our group one atoms and elements such as sodium, if they just lost one electron, they would actually end up on the other side of the periodic table and be a noble gas. So we can see that our group one and group two elements are really likely to lose electrons and become noble gases because just getting rid of one or two electrons gives them the remaining valence shell a full octet. On the other side, if we're pretty close to our noble gas on our right-hand side, like our chlorines and bromines and ionines, our halogen group, which is second from the right, they just have to gain one electron and then they'll become a noble gas, right? They have seven, they just need one more. And so they're very likely to become anions, to gain a negative charge and become anionic. So the likelihood of an element to gain or lose electrons is actually visible on our periodic table. Electrons can also change which shell they're in. They can go from a lower energy shell to a high energy shell or vice versa. If they go from a low energy shell, which we call the ground state, the lowest energy, to a higher energy shell, they need to have absorbed energy in order to jump to that level. So we'll absorb energy to go from low to high energy and move shells outward. If we want to go to a lower energy state, maybe we're at a high energy state and we want to drop down, we're going to emit energy. We're going to emit energy to drop to the ground state or a less excited state. So excited state, higher energy, we absorbed energy to get up there. If we're dropping down to ground state, we have to emit energy and we will do so in the form of what's called a photon. A photon is a packet of energy, also known as light, right? Electromagnetic wave, electromagnetic radiation is a photon, and that's emitted as an electron goes from an excited state to a ground state. This is called the photoelectric effect, and we can calculate the exact energy lost by multiplying the frequency of that electromagnetic radiation times Planck's constant. Planck did a lot of research on the photoelectric effect, and so our equation for that is E equals HF. See how there's a little physics overlap there with light? So even in the most basic general chemistry, we have a little physics overlap. We can visualize our valence shell electrons and how many we have by using what's called a Lewis dot structure. So a Lewis dot structure just visualizes for us how many valence electrons we have for a given element or atom. And we can do this even with bonding structures. So if we have chlorine, we should have seven dots because that's representing our seven valence electrons if again, it's the neutral atom form. If we have something like sodium, we should just have one valence electron in its neutral form. And this allows us to visualize what kind of valence electron structure we're working with and how it may change in a given atom, element, or ion. Our last topic to discuss in atomic structure is electron configuration and quantum numbers, which allow us to essentially fingerprint a given atom or element 
in a molecule. Before we do that, I'm Amanda Brem and I've been coaching pre-med students on their MCAT journeys since 2019. Please remember to subscribe to this channel for more videos on MCAT content and test taking strategies. If you'd like more interactive lessons on topics like these, including test taking skills and working through passages with me in a small group, please remember to check out our next available MCAT courses in the caption below. Let's now dive into quantum numbers and electron configuration. The four quantum numbers describe a specific electron in a given element, and we usually use it to describe the last or highest energy electron in an element, and we can use it to identify which element we're discussing. We'll want to talk about the quantum numbers in conjunction with orbitals, which are the types of shapes that the electrons make as they orbit a nucleus. Orbitals orbiting. Our first quantum number is the principal quantum number, and our principal quantum number, denoted as lowercase n, just denotes which electron shell we're in. So a quantum number of 1 means we're in electron shell 1 closest to the nucleus, that's where our furthest outermost electron is. In carbon, for example, our principal quantum number would be 2, because our outermost valence shell is shell 2, 2 away from the nucleus. Our very first shell, number one, in our principal quantum number can only hold two electrons. Once we go beyond two electrons or beyond a helium atom, we're now moving out into our outer orbital shells, which can each hold eight electrons. Our second quantum number is called the angular momentum number, and it really describes the shape of the orbital that the electron has. So there are four different types of shapes. There's S, P, D, and F. The S orbital shape is spherical. The P orbital shape is like this dumbbell or hourglass shape. The D orbital shape is a clover shape. And the F orbital shape is this like funky tetrahedral three-dimensional thing. We don't usually see F orbitals luckily on the MCAT, so we really want to focus our energy on S, P, or D orbitals. The angular momentum number allows us to know which orbital we're in for our outermost electron. So a number of zero indicates that we're in the s orbital, a number of one indicates we're a p orbital, and a number of two indicates we're a d orbital, and of course the number three indicates we're an f orbital. So our angular momentum number, denoted as l, will either be zero, one, two, or three, depending on the orbital we're in. We can determine the orbitals we're in based on the periodic table. So here's a periodic table that shows us where our outermost shell electron is based on their orbital structures. So we can see the s's are off to the left, p's are off to the right, and the d's are in the center. Our third quantum number is the magnetic quantum number, denoted as m subscript l. And this one tells us not just which orbital we're in, s, p, d, or f, but where in our orbitals we are. So each orbital shape can hold a certain amount of electrons, and that's specific to that orbital size. So we can see here with s, s only has one space, one orbital, and each orbital can fit up to two electrons. So this is denoted by the magnetic quantum number of zero. So if we're in an s orbital, which would mean l equals zero, then by definition, ml is also zero. Okay, so if we're in an s orbital, l zero, and ML is also zero. However, if we're in a P orbital, we have three different spaces we could be in. So we label these with the zero being in the center, the leftmost one being negative one, and the right-hand one being positive one. And again, these are the different options for our magnetic quantum number. So if we have four total electrons, we're going to fill these orbitals in a specific way using Aufbau's and Hund's principle. Aufbau's principle states that we're going to fill our lower energy orbitals first. So even if we have four electrons, we're going to fill our s orbital first because it's lower energy. Then if we have two more valence electrons, like carbon, carbon has four valence electrons, we'll use Hund's principle, which says that we will fill one electron in each orbital before we fill up just a partial orbital. So we're going to use the up arrows to indicate that the spin is up. We'll talk about that number in a second, but we're not going to go one, two, right? We're, what we're going to do is we're going to fill one, 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 go across the orbitals and then fill in the second electron in each orbital second. That is Hun's rule saying that we're filling them in order where we fill each orbital with one electron 
half filling them first, and then we'll go back and fill the others. So if we have five p electrons, we'll go one, two, three, four, five. And we would end up at zero for our magnetic number because our last electron is in the zero suborbital. Now again, if we're using carbon as our example here, we are going to fill it up to zero again. So, so far, we've got our principal number for carbon being two. We're in our outer orbital, second orbital out. Our angular momentum number is one because one indicates that we're in the p orbitals. And we're filling two, which gets us to the zero suborbital. So our magnetic number is zero. Our final number here is going to be our spin number. And we, our option here is either plus one half or negative one half. And all this is saying is whether or not our little electron is denoted as up or down. We can either spin up or down in our electron configuration. So we can see here that for our carbon, we're facing upwards, so our magnetic spin number is plus one half. So our full carbon quantum numbers is N2, L1, ML0, and MS plus one half. Again, if we filled a little bit more, let's go to oxygen. Oxygen has two more valence electrons than carbon. We would go one, two. Ah, now we're at ML negative one and MS one half. So we can, again, really identify the specific element or ionic form that we're looking at, right, cation or anion, based on where our final electron is. What we're drawing here is the electron configuration. So that we can say for carbon, we have 2s2, right, two electrons in the 2s orbital, right, because we're in the second row of the periodic table. And then we can say 2p2, because we have two electrons in the p orbital. Again, if we were looking at an element further down the periodic table, the d orbitals indicated by L2, we would have 0, minus 1, minus 2, plus 1, plus 2 for our ML options. Again, we would still only have plus or minus 1 half for MS, because up or down. And then for our f orbital, L equals 3. Again, the 0 is in the center, so we have minus 1, minus 2, minus 3 plus one, plus two, plus three for our options for our magnetic number. I hope this video is helpful in brushing off the rust from our general chemistry knowledge and remembering our atomic structure, which is of course the foundation of all of our other chemistries. Now you'll be ready to answer MCAT style questions on things like valence shells, magnetic numbers, electron configuration, and identifying metals versus non-metals, versus isotopes on test day. If you'd like more foundational videos on general chemistry topics like this, please let me know in the comments below. And as always, happy studying.